So relevance is actually one of our, our core values. So we have you know, stewardship, that preservation aspect, um, authenticity, you know, and, and relevance. And I think relevance is kind of key. And one of the reasons, for instance, we're trying to exercise a lot of these uh, principles in our new Welcome Center is that we are finding that as our audience broadens and there are people, um, but even within our own community, who aren't as intimately connected to the Bay as they might once have been. We can't assume that they understand what it's like to grow up uh, with family members or community members uh, who, are, who are working the water. And so we need to find ways to um, create universal stories that humanize that experience, even if you don't know about boats per se. Um, and that's really one of the goals of, this, of these new exhibitions. Storytelling uh, is the way that we, we make ourselves relevant and that we connect with people um, by looking to our oral histories, looking to our documents, um, and telling like, all these broad and, and diverse stories um, of the individual experience, which comments on the collective. I mean, the, the first thing that greets you is, is a map of the Chesapeake, uh, you know, uh, impressed, uh, stained onto the very floor in front of you. And, and that's where you get that sense where land and water are inextricably entwined. Um, we purposefully made it representational. Um, people can find their place on it. We'll have cards where you can say, okay, well, I came from here and, and here's where we are now. But the idea is to take a look at your feet, to see the map in front of you, to take a look to your right, to see the amazing view of the Miles River. And then when you look to your left, you have vistas of uh, some of the watercraft in our collection, uh, these amazing murals, many of them photos by photographer Dave Harp, that give a sense of uh, the landscape on the bay itself. And so at a glance, and then inviting you to look more deeply and to read more deeply, you get a sense of, of the experience that you'll have, and also a, that core uh, understanding that you need to have to, to really appreciate what you're going to see. You know, boats are objects of use. They represent human stories, and sometimes that story is a story of an innovative boat builder or one looking to, to make a living. Sometimes it's a story that connects to uh, young people, young women learning to sail for the first time. One example I can think of, and there's, there's several great ones, but one that we really had to dig in is uh, of a, a power log canoe uh, named Alberta. Uh, we knew its later history. It came to us, had been converted for recreational use, but we knew it had been used for oystering, um, named for an oysterman's wife, Alberta. Um, and, um, but we didn't know much more about the family. Fillmore King was the oysterman. He was a black oysterman uh, living in the Kent Island region. And, you know, we took the opportunity to kind of look and see what else we could find out about him and his life. Um, and we started with the census records and there's not much more because too often the, you know, the stories of, of, of black watermen's lives and black people's lives were, are not in the newspaper. Um, that's the only place we could find them. You know, I found a record of him uh, living in his mother's household in the 1860s. Uh, there was, a, she was a single parent. When I next see him, he's already working as a waterman. He's living with Alberta, uh, with Alberta's brother as well. They, um, he, he's buying his own home. You know, he said he had a mortgage. Um, they had no children at that point. But uh, he is succeeding enough, working only six months of the year, and it does indicate how long uh, he worked in, in any given year, successful enough that he's able to purchase his own home. This continues. We know it's about this time that he purchased the vessel that he then renames Alberta. It was built uh, about, uh, you know, in the early part of the 1900s. We think he purchased it in the teens or 20s. Um, so he's working, he continues to work, and then Alberta dies. And she was taking in washing on her own, so they had a family income. They had no children. It said that she'd lost a number of children. As he ages, he's still working. Even as a widower, he's working. And then we see him really in his 80s, um, no longer able to work, probably because of his advanced age, living in someone else's household, no longer in his own home. And so his fortunes rose and fell with that industry. The other thing that we see that's really interesting is the community of Oysterman he lived in is both black and white people living together. So the census taker often went door to door. So from door to door, we're seeing, you know, uh, names of black watermen, almost all of them um, in that industry, and then uh, white men working as Oystermen as well. So that's quite revealing. And so just really basic facts but do give us a light, a light so shed some light into that um, idea that 
fortunes were made and fortunes were lost based on your physical ability to work. And that's just the tip of the iceberg.